Claus are here. Come Santa Claus away. <gasps> Santa Claus away. He's got the toys with balls and baubles and boys and girls to play. Can you tell Christmas is my favorite holiday? My favorite bank holiday, as it were. My favorite bank holiday. A holiday, don't you think, like, the banks get something out of everything? Why don't we just have Happy Bank Day and wish all the filthy, obscenely rich banking people of the world a good day? <laughs> you know, enjoy robbing us blind. I think they want us to suffer because it's more pleasurable. If we actually gave them a rousing and raucous ascent, they'd be like, it's no fun anymore. <laughs> That's my plan for world peace. Just tell the bankers we enjoy getting fucked up the ass. Please, screw us even more deeply. <laughs> to be truthful, I don't know any bad bankers. I mean, no banking person has ever done me any harm. But that doesn't mean they're not capable of. If I wanted to control the world, what would I do? I would simply do everything I'm already doing because I already control the entire world. I control everybody. I control you. You work for me, bitch. <laughs> I don't need money. Money, shmoney. Where we're going, we don't need money. We just need the ability to suffer silently. Imagine if suffering in silence, as many women and men and children have done, was actually worth money, and you got a check from the government. It's like, we've been monitoring how much you've suffered in silence, how long, Here's a check for $10 billion. It's like, dude, like, people look at you like, you must have really been suffering. Yeah, I always thought my suffering was worse than other people's suffering. And you were really silent, according to them. Except for the last seven years, you started a YouTube account. They're like, it, then they slash like $9 billion from it because of, I've been, I've broken the silence too many times. <laughs> they send me a check for $10. And so, that's all my suffering's worth now because I talk too much. I like this better than my hovel. <laughs> this is better than my hovel. This is the best non-hovel any anywhere. This is a great little spot. I like this little spot. I just don't know. I look around because I don't know if I'm gonna see someone or I mean I'm pretty sure sometimes people could walk out into that section of forest. And I don't want someone to kind of get freaked out by someone sitting out here. So the more comfortable you look, the more likely someone's going to think you live out here. And if they think you, you're enjoying yourself too much or living out here, then they call the police. So that's a little scary. You know, there's quite an anti-homeless sentiment around the area. In fact, anti-looking like homeless. Like you got to be like, oh, I'm just uh, infecting the trees with my so-called wisdom. Nothing, nothing going on. What is wisdom? Is there a why? Is there wisdom after domestication? Wise dominion. Wisdom. Wise dominion. The woman and the van must come together. If I was Lord of the Universe, I'd give everyone a panel van. <laughs> you can drive around in your panel van. Maybe a moped. Maybe I'd give everyone a Gideon's Bible. If I won the lottery, if I won $55 million, I'd give everyone I know a free Gideon's Bible. <laughs> With a coupon for another Gideon's Bible, in case you ever wear this one out. It's <laughs> good stuff, baby. That's some, that's some pretty good reading right there. You know, I was really shocked when I saw that there was a New Testament because after looking at the Old Testament, I was like, wow, how could you improve on this? <laughs> oh, wait, Jesus, the Lord of all financial remedy through mortal torture of human flesh, and every other order of our flesh through the celestial movement of the heavens, through the harvest and love of the cradle of our Mother Earth. How could you improve? Oh, I see. Well, that's, that's quite the improvement. <laughs>
If the New Testament is unproven, what does that make the Old Testament? Perhaps I should have confined my use of the Holy Bible as toilet paper to the New Testament. Perhaps the Book of John would have been more apt. <laughs> I remember one day wiping my ass with the Book of John while thinking about the irony of wiping your ass with the Book of John. And then I held this excrement, um, benighted page of Holy Scripture from the Book of John that I had once studied reverently and thought, man, that's that's good for a laugh. At least God was good for something, finally. Oh, <laughs> God's good for a laugh. I, I never knew what this wall was good for. Like, what is the Bible good for? It's, I wouldn't even use it as a doorstop. You know? <laughs> I, when you, I think to use the Bible as toilet paper is to elevate it to a level of usefulness unlike any it's ever had before. I asked Jesus, and he said, this, in fact, was the original purpose of the Bible. It's good in all weather, you know. And it feels really good to smear its disgusting pages with something of an improvement by way of the exercise of wiping it over the benighted asshole in question. The only danger is really that the asshole will become more filthy than it already is based on contact with God's holy word. Perhaps that's why it's called the holy word. <laughs> Perhaps God is the person that that guy was writing that song, The Brown-Eyed Girl. It's more like The One-Eyed Monster. Is that Roy Orbison? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. I think it's something else. Leaving on a jet plane. Don't know when I'll be back again. God, show me your infinite nature now, or I will hate you always. I love my mother, and I love nature. Nature is really good for me. The sun is coming up. I wish my whole family well, even the pedophiles. Nothing's ever going to make me feel better about what they did. So what does it do me to really, I mean, curse them. Yeah, I don't really curse them. I just like, I think about the effects of what they've done. I think about the enormity of my ignorance as to how this type of thing can come about. And I endure the many angers and bitterness and, and voids in all of my knowing of these people and all of their lack of knowing of me and all of their disrespect for my mother and her flesh and blood that could come about from people who are like doctors and high school teachers who love the Lord. I mean, how is that possible? And my life isn't about really hating people as much as I hate them. It's about figuring out all these types of things happen. I, I'm not going to spend my life reading books that are supposed to tell me the reason for these things because they're never going to. We don't have enough time in the world. Just like everyone can't learn all the technology, we can't learn about all the magic being used against us. In every way it's impacted us. Humans have incorporated it into their life, into their body language. I've always felt that there was something larger at work in the, that people, particularly predatory people, can never seem to be able to read my body language. Or they don't like my body language, you know, and it's something that most people usually don't have occasion to object to. The sun is going to come right between these two trees. Smack me in the face like the Lord's dick. The Lord's dick. The Lord's dick. The Lord's stick. <laughs> I should write a story called The Lord's Stick. The Lord's Stick. The Lord's stick was very big. The Lord's dick was very hard. The Lord's dick was very stiff. The Lord's dick was very smart. <laughs> One day, the Lord's dick became snarled up in some other dicks. <laughs> and it became confused and rough and frothing at the mouth 
like its own mother's vagina when it was born. <laughs> and this became the froth of the sea. <laughs> sea froth. And mermaids were born like scaly sperm looking for the dragon ovum that was lay somewhere in a crypt beneath the mantle of the earth. Everything in the world was changed because of the snarling of the Lord's dick, among other dicks. So, let this be a lesson to you men. Never allow your stick to get snarled with other sticks. Always keep your stick to yourself, and always keep it hard and true and pointed to the North Star. It'd be fun if when your dick became erect, it pointed to a certain star. <laughs> it's like, it's like pointed north. It's like, which way is north? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Tell your wife to take off that sweater. Fetching as it is. There we go. North is right there. It's like, I don't believe you. It's always pointed at my wife's ass. Well, she always, she seems to know which direction north is. <laughs> Unfortunately, so does her ass. <laughs> I call it the North Star. If my dick was a wand, what would I use it for? I would wish all women... Oh, hello, dear. Hi. Beautiful spring. What a blessing to this place, the first day of the Christmas break. Hi. I like how deer can just hang out with you like this. That's so pretty. Hey. I like how it's no big thing for them, you know? It's no big thing for them to see a strange white male standing and sitting there. It's so amazing. It's like they just, they're used to being the coons. If you're cool, they're cool. You might have some other people in their family. The spirit that is dear. There we go. They're coming along. Hi, hi. The spirit of the deer so very dear. The dearest my, my love, my dear, dear love. Hey. Oh, oh. They can just eat in front of me. It's amazing. Just like 20 feet away from me. Hi. My love. I've never sat anywhere for the first time and had this happen. It's so cool. I'm glad I came back here. Three or four. Hi. Closer. You gotta breathe the way they breathe. That's how you listen to them. Hi. Lovely forest. How the sun came around. Hi. Between these trees. What a blessing you are. It's okay, you can go this way. You can go this way. You're going around the other way. The last one's a little more timid. Or didn't see the way the other one. Didn't 
can see the way the the alpha female went through. That's okay. There's always a way, isn't there? There we go. Cool. Four or five deer coming through. And they just appear just like that. It's like it's a little startling because they're so quiet. You see their poop everywhere. So that's really neat. I don't think I've ever sat in a new place in the forest on the first day. This is I call this Christmas forest. I basically get to see four reindeer. Well, four deer is the case might be. There's been a lot of really good omens about this particular location. You know, deer connected to the magical realm, the druidic realm, the Norse realm. I mean deer are the portal of every sort of heathen mythology, you know. You're starting a great story of knowledge and myth and wiles and wonders of man, mirth and magic. You would start it with a deer or a hen. I think those were all females, by the way. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they haven't. No, I, I, I don't know. I didn't see any horns. So. Anyway, they were. I didn't really get. feel a little bit guilty. This is such a lovely experience. <laughs> the hunter would love it if he could just sit and his quarry would just walk right by him. I'm so thankful that I didn't start all them. It's such an honor that they can just walk by you like that. Like just everyone was like, look, look, oh, we just say hi. As soon as we made eye contact, they were fine. Like a white woman would have been, oh, we fuck. And it's like, I love it when you just meet people in the wild and they're just like, hey, I want to be seen like a magical creature too. You know, I don't want to be seen like a pedophile or a rapist or something. Like I, I don't want to hurt anyone. The worst thing I'm going to do is if you're scared, it's going to freak me out or make me angry. That's you know. So, you know, if you're studying like white males in the local area, like just don't get so freaked out if you see us. You know, I don't think there's any rapes in the area. Um, <laughs> I just, if any idea like what would happen to me. Like, what happens to me if I make a woman slightly uncomfortable? Like, really, I practice being a nice man. You know? And women, of course, have a reason to be concerned. Sometimes, if you're on the receiving end of their fears, you wish they would just read energy as well as those deer. And that's a little too much to ask of. But, uh, you know, people come to their fears honestly. And certainly, to see a strange person in the woods would be a fearsome thing. I'm sure. <laughs> Whoa. I rarely run into people when I'm out here, and I'm sure if I did, I'd be like, what magical creature is this? <laughs> Maybe one day we'll meet each other. <laughs> we'll both be masturbating at different ends of the forest on the same day, and we won't even meet each other. Be like, wait a second, were you there on March the 16th, 2025? <laughs> I don't know, even if that were true, how would two, it'd be like a good movie, like two people masturbating on the same day, different ends of the same forest. How would they ever, A, meet each other, and B, have this conversation? <laughs> how would that come about? As a writer, like, I want to ask Holly, Jewish Hollywood writers, you know, how would you, you know, do you meet at a bar? Do you, is one person um, doing, a, applying a lie detector test to somebody? <laughs> They see a movie where something like that happens and they're watching it at the same time going, hey, this reminds me of something. Hey, it reminds me of something too. And so there's, they're like the movie within the movie, within the movie, within the movie. And suddenly they're like, this is better than masturbating. And like they form a love that changes the world forever. <laughs> Basically, if I break it down, 
imagine two people watching a movie that's about how they didn't realize they had met when they were masturbating in two different locations in the same park. Or maybe that's just what a homeless chronic masturbator would imagine is a good movie. <laughs> so if anyone ever asked me, what would you think is a good movie? That's what I'd tell you. And it would explain to you exactly the kind of person. That, yeah. Throw in a time machine and Darth Vader and you've basically got me there with it. You had me a chronic masturbation, you know. <laughs> this is great. Those mirrors were amazing. They were really nice. I really appreciate the meeting them. They were really nice. I'm glad I didn't bother them. Like, this is, I, I even said earlier, this is a very dear part of the forest. It's very dear. It's a very specific area. Two owls yesterday, four deer today. Very lucky to find this. And a very pleasant day, cold as it is. I should get going soon. I know, I always say that. But... I'm a little paranoid of spending too much time in here. I think there's a woman with this deer sitting here. I suspect there is a sort of wild craft woman that lives along the area and she feeds the deer and I think now and then she probably comes out to look for owls or something. Why wouldn't you if you lived here? You know, I would come out. And so I've got to... And here's the thing, you got to be logical. If there's a local woman who comes out here, she's probably not used to seeing anyone out here. So I've got to prepare for maybe seeing a white female who's not used to seeing anyone out here who's local, who tend to be litigious. <laughs> so I'm like, please don't litigate me. Don't fumigate me. Basically, no local white man has good reason to be doing what I'm doing right now. Nobody does this. No one just like, oh yeah, you're one of those people that go out in the woods and talk to yourself because the human voice is an amazing thing and the woods is a great place to practice using it as a celestial instrument to help bring about healing, knowledge, and just a hell of a good way to spend your time and use your mind and enjoy connecting to the earth in other ways besides taking out your recycling and telling people that the world is going to boil or freeze and it's our fault. <laughs> We're turning to Venus, Venus, because it's not fair. It's all because Jesus, Jesus, grew very long hair. <laughs> it's the final countdown. Da -da -da -da. Da -da 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 -da. It's the final countdown. Da -da -da. Da -da 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 -da. Da -da -da. The thing is that every countdown, when they do like, you know, 10 this, 10 this, is a final countdown because it's always a countdown to death. I believe that the word in or the word O-N or O-N-E could all be taken to mean death, uh, that uh, God brings death into the world, death comes into the world, death is the hero of the Bible, death is born when we are, dead is the soul that is born, it can be a financial instrument fulfilled by Genesis and the torture of Jesus, which are all um, versions of natural rhythms and the sacred song of the sun and, uh, and of the fundamental rhythms of our lives that they are joined not just to the core puzzles of what your brain and blood happens to be doing but to the very umbilical of the living song of the heavens and the earth the deer come in there no, there shitty eyesight which is like a bear so it's like how ironic <laughs> oh. I think the great thing about bears is they're big so eventually you'll figure it out trust me 
<laughs> You'll know if I see a bear because I'll be like, um, putting all my stuff on it. And just, like, there'll be no more talking. It'll just be me stuffing that into my pocket. And you'll be like, oh, I guess the video's over now. <laughs> it's like priorities and staying out of their way. That's called respect, people. And the deer have very good eyesight. They just looked at me again. Okay, so we're good. But as long as I'm here and I haven't made a nuisance of myself, then things are good. I basically, as soon as I become a nuisance to this environment or a white woman, I will leave and go back to the way, well, the last four or five years where I just didn't do this. But I hope it's okay. There is the local female witch or whatever. I don't want to step on her dress, as it were. I mean, I think that, you know, if I was a homeowner and I lived next to a potential park and I came out, interacted positively with the environment and I never saw anyone out there, um, I would feel really safe and I would feel that, that was kind of like my place. But there's the other side to it, which is that the closer you actually get to a forest, <laughs> If you were to see someone like me, um, you'd probably be okay with it. Because you're probably in touch with your instincts. And let's face it, I'm not a predator. As you can see, I'm not sitting out here in wait to... <laughs> I obviously don't want to see someone. I'm the opposite. I'm an avoider. Predators ultimately want to make some kind of contact with their prey. Even, but they do. Yeah, I have heard of men want, you know, waiting in forests for women. It's, you know, I just, my God, actually, there was a story that came out of Vancouver of some guy jumping out of trees and exposing himself or something. It's like, oh my God, that just ruins it for all of the chronic masturbators in the world. You know? And the day men put their dicks away and do not touch themselves among the wooded places because of the cunt that ruined it for all of us. You don't jump on them, man. You don't reveal yourself. You just wait quietly and imagine all kinds of things could happen in that kind of penthouse forum kind of way when you're safely in your home and not wandering around looking for things to spark another night of raucous and insipid loneliness. <laughs> Pull up your pants, man. Be a man. Go out. Do it decently. Get drunk. Get her drunk. Get a job first. Buy her something. Tell her you like her eyes. And uh, see if, you know, putting your bungo bongos together while intoxicated by alcohol without any real knowledge of each other in any real sense turns out well for either of you. It's like a social experiment. Everyone should get a chance to try it. <laughs> it's 100% of a failure, but we'll keep trying. One day, someone will get it right. That's called satire. <laughs> In those days, alcohol became a part of truly loving relationships. It was put in the nursery. It was symbolized in many ways all over the house and all over all of our advertising and the major stories of the world. The major religions at some point all bow down to Al Kul, the eater of all bodies, the loather of all children, and the bestower of all graces to those who kept their oaths to the almighty innkeeper in the sky. <laughs> so, death is in the beginning, right? In the beginning was the word, in the beginning, and the word was death, and death was in the beginning with God. When God came into the world, death came into the world. God is death, and so the soul that is a financial instrument, doomed and damned to all debt, that sustains any value that the flesh and blood of the spirit ever attained to prior to God's invasion of the earth. And that soul is meant to have a God complex because it is a part of God. This belongs to God and so it represents God. So every soul represents God. It's really weird, isn't it? <laughs> Understatement. It, it is. God is born. When death is born, death and God and the soul are all born together. And as much as 
all of this is basically for your sake. This is not done for God's pleasure. It, it's not done for any other reason but for humans. This story is all for humans. No other animal believes in souls. No other, they just accept whatever, you know, and um, and they go on living their lives. But this kind of rhetoric, this this magic, these words, this death coming into the world, this alchemy of the, you'll notice in songs that, that have the word tonight, that the night, tonight, is a code word for death. Two means death, the death of night. <clears throat> out of which the morning comes. And the day itself, when the sun sets, it dies. And death rules the world. Death and winter rule the world. Right, death is the plot, the grave plot of every theatrical story that God spins like a yarn, a cocoon around our native tongue, our native heritage, which is not just cavemen and um, Neolithic, fat women with giant tip, giant tip, ruling the world. <laughs> you know, I bet you those Neolithic women with big tits would really love Star Wars, because like, they'd recognize Darth Vader, Darth Vader as basically them, the Black Mother. Right? They'd come out of Star Wars and be like, "How'd you like it? Oh, I love the protagonist, Darth Vader." <laughs> You can see how he saved everyone from their, their, uh, their, uh, their blood poisoning. He liberated everyone from their sin. <laughs> he collected all the dead. Spun it all into a giant vortex of the star of death itself. The star of Bethlehem. The star, the death in the bones. The death out of the bones. The celestial pall. The ceremony of the dead, the languages of the dead, the languages of the dead soul. The soul contains the dead sun, which is one in the beginning. So when people say that they want to become one with their soulmate, they're really saying that they want to become death, the death that was born like their love when they were born, to pay its debt or its death to God in the form of all of its labors to survive such a world, in any world, in any family that would commend you to that world, in any mother's womb that would say, this is natural, in every uh, mother history, in every mother anthropology, in every mother creation story or mother God story that commends you to such and such a doom, inveigled around you in ways that you can't hope to extricate yourself from but must extrude yourself into a theater of the damned in order to get what only an inferior but synthesized version of your natural mind and spirit must now resort to considering the entire range of possibilities to be free and safe and someone worth anything to anyone. Now, you might be wondering, where do I get such ideas? Everywhere. You know? <laughs> From the pain of things. Many things that have made me think more deeply about religion and its role. I don't really believe in David Icke anymore, but David Icke. You know, people that made me think, anyone that made me think. A lot of people... David Icke is actually Sir Richard Branson, so he's a he's a paid actor. But it's not just what they say. When you think, when your brain expands beyond David Icke, let's say your thinking expands beyond this level, which is fine. By the way, that's not arrogant. Like your brain will expand beyond everyone's thinking that you encounter because their thinking is both limited by and expanded by your own adaptations of their thinking. Okay. So in other words, anything I'm worth saying is like music to you, then you're the instrument claiming that music. Now it's yours to do it as you wish, to improve it, to deconstruct it, and that's freedom, right? So it's not, you should be going beyond certain thinkers, but David Icke is Sir Richard Branson. And it's like, it's not just what he says, it's, <coughs> it's what he doesn't say. 
It's what all the prayers and all the instructional hours of all the magazines and narratives and news of the world, sometimes don't you think it's just what, what we don't say, what is not said? I'd love to see a, the big book of what we never say. And no, it's not Jerry Maguire. You know, he writes this memo, what we think and do not say. And he gets fired for it, but he finds the love of his life when he realizes that love is something more than just for your job. And that's like a modern novel. That Jerry Maguire is basically the reinvention of the modern novel, which is to survive and yet through a heroic mythology to advance the basic precepts of the civilized world. So buried in Jerry Maguire would be a lot of biblical precepts. Pain. Let's think about it. The child in the movie doesn't have a father, not even at the end of the movie. Okay, Where's his real father? So that's gone. So right away, just like the Bible, you've eliminated the father. Now, did I know that before I made this video? No. It's because I study the world. I, I expect to see it. And there it is. If you expect to see it, you see it. If you don't want to see it, you can't see it. If you can't hear the music, you don't hear the music. Do you hear the music? Do you hear the song of my own sweet fear? Do you hear that everything that is so dear, passing here, passing here, like the breath upon my fear, like the breath upon my fear, like the breath upon my fear, on my fear, on my fear, that I do not deserve, I do not deserve to be here, to be here, to be here. Shh, I smell something rotten, that our birth was begotten. I think my father was made to pay a dire price, even though, even though we came from paradise. Came from paradise. I feel like I'm a really weird 80s pop star that nobody ever cared about, and now he just feels like he's bitter and he didn't get the attention he deserved. You ever, you ever met any artists or musicians who really feel... Like, I've met, and they have their wonderful delusions. They smoke weed like me, and they're like, yeah, one day I'm going to be on an international stage with Elton John and upside-down crucifixes that are burning, belting out my own songs. You know, it's like, okay, you can be my, I know it goes so far, like, we landed, you can be my stage manager. And, you know, and it's like, they're really following the fantasy. And I'm like, okay, you know, okay, I'm not a musician, but, like, that would be, like, I would watch that film, you know, the... You know, the guy living in a trailer wearing women's clothes, writing songs I don't really like, but believing that he's going to be a superstar. <laughs> a transvestite superstar. Transgender. You don't say transvestite anymore. But I like transvestite, you know? Vest. Vestal. You could be a transvestal virgin. You know? <laughs> think about that. I think I'm going to dig that. Nobody's got that yet. I claim it. I got dibs. Patent right here. Transvestal virgin. That's perfect. If I ever get forced to go to Burning Man, that would be my special skill. Transvestal virginity. <laughs> What's that? You have to come to my tent at 12 midnight and you'll find out. I'll get a t-shirt that says, Never been fucked. <laughs> People won't know what gender I am. I'll wear tight little pink shorts with a hole in the middle that says bullseye. <laughs> A rhino horn. Hey everyone, here's to never knowing whether you're coming or going. <laughs> whether you're given or receiving. <laughs> you know what? I, I wrote poetry for many years and I always kept sex out of it as a rule. Like well into my 30s. I had I remember I was writing a manuscript. It was like this thick. I had a briefcase. I would carry it around Salisbury Island while hitchhiking, you know, so people would see me. <laughs> Ridiculous briefcase, but it had my manuscript in it. I just fucking working on my manuscript, motherfucker. It was all longhand, right? So 20, 30 pages, quatrains, you know? And I was examining it. Also, it's of note that I was very lonely. So as you can tell, that's a big part of my life. And um, 
a bunch of lonely stories that you don't want to hear that would only serve to explain to you why I don't have any friends. So there's really no point. I can't even muster up, you know, I can't get like an erection for telling people about the perfection of my life story because nobody wants to see that kind of dick. Even though it is very veiny, lonely as they are, the many veins of the pilaster of my life have indeed um, conspired to assuage a riveting and depraved claim upon my flesh and blood, which I scarcely even know that I can spell out adequately upon my lips. And that is the true evil and woe which I, which I most wish to survive. And I take the greatest amount of joy in surviving the greatest amount of evil. And seeing that in the passing of this moment in my life, and by no means would I tell you I have avoided suffering at all. But it's like, I feel okay, people. And I feel, and I want to feel more. And this is the poverty of me. That I will try. The thing that keeps me honest and humble is that I want to work hard in any way, shape, or form I can on this earth and bring peace and health to my home and my body and, and share that with other people. And if that's the price, the price, I, price I pay or the price I take, and whatever citation I wish to give myself for the parlay, which I know that I will enjoy to the utmost, and notwithstanding that of an interest which could not be compounded among any number of people, to some sufficient degree to begin to register along the line or total set of integers in the universe, um, it would have to exist on a parallel timeline where numbers themselves are symbols that spell out of language that amounts to everything that needs to be attended to by the mother herself in every possible way across time, giving us great relief to the mind, which suffers the most, these slights and debts and dooms, which we can, uh, cannot even wish we have enough hours of labor in order to adequately pay for, much less to spell out to our own satisfaction, without first coming upon a million, million more deaths and dooms than we should ever like to add to those we have already suffered from and done everything in our power to avoid having to talk about it all. Sometimes I really shouldn't smoke as much. <laughs> <laughs> See, I wish I had a bro to tell me that. You know, without being disrespectful, like, okay, I get that you're smart, bro. Sometimes you should just take a breath, just enjoy the moment. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying the moment is all I've got. But I'm saying I've got a lot more than that. I got the purpose of the mother coursing through my veins. I know the words and the time and the days that it takes to spell out a song that's worthy of my own flesh and blood, to sustain a raucous choir of angels spilling from the mouths of these limbs and roots, and these many years and leagues of years, teeming with the patient and impatient languors and murmurs of my fellow man. I alone solitary and suffering from every ignorance that man has ever been meant to suffer from lest he gather that courage and discipline which it takes to do his part in the right kind of wheel of magic of war and mayhem of recreation and reproduction that no one needs to worry about because no one pays attention to it because it's just like that of everybody else and that's the best way to be invisible is to do what everyone else is doing in the group once you do something different, people notice. They're smart enough to notice, but they're not always smart enough to notice what they're noticing. They might just be smart enough in one way to be scared as fuck about anything that is the way that you are. I think the, the weirdest thing that people don't think about what can get you bullied since you were a child, and one of the ways, and one of the many different fields of human action where I feel bullied, is people making fun of me for how I talk and how I think and how I like to use my voice intellectually. Um, and so I do keep my thoughts to myself. I've, as a child, I learned not to think too much because people would bully me. A particular example, and you don't know this because you're not conscious of who you are or what you sound like until someone makes fun of you and then you realize, oh, that's bad. You might sense it, and because you can sense it and then it happens, you feel all the more wrong. It's like, like if you were someone who took out their penis for no reason and like you knew it was wrong, but you weren't sure and you were just that stupid, you know, and you say something and it was like, it's like my dick is hanging out. 
You know what I mean? It's like, I didn't know that you could say something. And it was like the same as if you just let your dick out. You know, it's like, how how is thinking? You know, so I remember this one young man I was talking to, and it's silly, but I still feel embarrassed. But this gives, I want you to see how effectively the child's mind is civilized and domesticated by the school system. So I was maybe 13 or 14 years old. I could have been 10 or 11. It, that sounds pretty old, but, you know, I don't even think I was that mature. And I was hanging out, and there were some ants on the stoop of his strata townhouse. They, and he didn't have a dad that I know of. And he had a younger brother. And we, were, we were okay friends. We'd hang out, do stuff. Soft feeling. And I said, without thinking, in that way that I would say to people, it was really nice at any time of life when you forget that you're not supposed to know something, and or at least pretend like you know something. And I said, isn't it interesting that to understand the biology of the ants would be to scale our sense of time to the sense of their purpose and organization among their number? So in a sense, they, you could say they lived in a different temporal dimension. And in that way, we would be along the way to better understanding and appreciating the power of ants. And it, I mean, you can say that in many simpler ways, and it's extraordinarily pedantic. And you could say it as simple as like, animals don't have a sense of time, but everything they do has a certain kind of perfect timing that's in proportion to their particular labors on the earth, and what you can extend beyond that of the scope of their physical habits, that of their more ephemeral purpose among a raucous choir, um, celestial orders and organs of the earth like everything is working together all over the earth all the time so you know is it spending its time defending itself from human beings or is it spending its time helping us defend ourselves from god and the banking system and not even that we have to say that it's all completely wrong but that there's a lack of balance between how our brains have been developing and sustaining enough of a resistance because we do have a core resistance but i think that since the world is excessively predatory it can't ever be a thousand percent predatory because then we would all die right and it's not because it can't even kill us all it's because or it won't it wouldn't if it could it can't it only has so much power it stops its power stops at a, a level of man and a level of our regenerative power and a level of our sacred intelligence that it cannot, in fact, imprison. But it can imprison enough and harry us enough by the range of its persuasive influence over a mind that it's able to accept from its own fundamental nature and draw it out into projections of itself anthropologically, biblically, and so on, where there is a great reinforcement of the stretching of the human mind into certain rather violent and warlike fields of action that are now meant to be supposed to be natural or under the influence of the supernatural. You know, that as humans have ever come together to do anything, they have been beset with a level of violence that must be controlled at the risk of allowing it to groom and manipulate the very violence it's, it's supposed to solve. That's what would be what happened when, that would be what happened if humans, because they worked, and this is a theory that you might not have heard before. Because, theory, because humans, as we could extrapolate or suppose or de-engineer, used to be so much more coherent at different levels of brain function, say, pre-God, then a certain type of disease was able to take over the entire human mind. That even as fragmented, as unevolved as it is today, it could still be entirely controlled because it used to entirely work together so well. So like the ancient Lemuria, the mind was kind of a single continent upon the earth. <clears throat> The idea of like Atlantis being drowned is the idea of that continent being engulfed and overwhelmed by something which came as though from a supernatural level, but also connected to the earth and taking on the power of the earth as though it could need to kill and drown us and stifle our voice. 
even beneath the water of the mother's flesh and blood, the continent of the mind would be sublimated and subjugated to the God that would take over from the Mother Earth. So Atlantis is a vestige of like a myth that would have come out of like a series of world myths that allow God to transfer ownership from the Earth's heritage to, to him and to the banking system, which is always about controlling currents of energy, or currents of water. It's always conducting a mercantile trade, that of the ocean of man's origins and power. Are we beneath our power? Is our power lay within? Does someone, can someone take away our power? And so how people can take away our power, how anyone can manipulate or curb us, can help us theoretically understand how the world, if it was so coherent, could be so completely manipulated. Isn't that fascinating? I think that's fascinating. I don't read books many, many much anymore because nothing stimulates my mind enough to think about these things. If you can recommend me a book that talks about these things, um, then by all means. In a sense, all books talk about these things. That siren is talking about these things. I think I'm going to go. I've been sitting here long enough. And I'm paranoid, so... Okay, we got one more joint in there. Yes, here we go. Okay, let's go. I'm gonna have some peanut butter. Oh, the beer will cool. I can tell you that's the third siren I've heard today. So. I've never heard so many sirens in my life. On Salt Spring, you almost never heard them. I think the people are healthier there. I didn't even know they had ambulances. Never heard them. time at Christmas forest. I'll tell you this, I, I think sometimes my fears predict the future, but we'll see what happens. Places like this, I might still have to consider amber zone, meaning I might have prepared myself for the fact that theoretically, if I spend enough time here, I will have a bad experience with somebody. So. You gotta keep that in mind. I don't wanna be a foregone conclusion. I gotta be careful. I gotta be humble, you know? I, I have this time out here. I gotta be thankful because I gotta admit that if a white person comes out here, sees me, they just, they're not used to seeing people. And also they tend to think that anyone who looks remotely homeless is homeless and that homeless people are basically criminals. Even though in all the years I've been walking here, I've never met a single homeless person living in these woods. If you talk to the locals, it's like they're like a constant threat of infesting the area. They worry about them more than they worry about rodents getting into their home. It's a kind of disease, really. To me, in a way, they're projecting their own homelessness, you know? They're not comfortable in their own bodies, you know? Don't you know? You know, I'm feeling a little nervous. Maybe that's why. Maybe I just need to. I need it for a while. Actually, I could head to the beach. The sun's coming up. That's what I'm going to do. Let's go. Let's get out of here. I'm gonna forego the hat because I think people just think it makes me look like a stoner, which is exactly what I am. I don't know how anyone could respond.
Hey, I'm taking out my penis. Ooh, it's so heavy. It almost strains my wrist. But... It's like an elephant's tusk. I can crack my back a lot of times when I'm urinating. It's really a good time to crack your back. <coughs> kind of shows that the bladder is connected to the spine. <coughs> I think that imagine a really healthy people like me and even more. Okay. And like, I'm not healthy in all ways, but imagine a really healthy people like us or you or me and how much they would have learned about their own bodies combined with whatever knowledge they had acquired about the human body that they could connect to in their own experience and they could feel in their body different connections between different organs under different conditions. Imagine people connected to their bodies with all kinds of medical intelligence. I mean, just see how, like, that's just another theory of anthropology where you could see that there's probably a lot of human heritage that has been lost because a lot of human health has been lost because that knowledge would have been bound up in our health. The way the modern world and the banking system of God is bound up more so in our disease. No wonder it wants you to think that you're born disease or that death and disease is born because you were born as though from a mother. A lot of twisting of the English language. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna walk to the beach. Good. Just collecting myself a little bit. Okay, and I could walk out in a conventional way, or I could leave in an unconventional way. I think I'll leave in the unconventional way. I mean, I think as long as Christmas forest. Bye. It's gotta touch it. No, it's real. It's so cool. I love Christmas. A forest called Christmas. That'd be a good short story. Maybe I should write that. If I get home alive, that's what I'll do. A forest called Christmas. Where a man gets himself so cold that he doesn't know what to do with himself. I, I have let myself get very cold today. I would usually recommend such a thing. I should be paying more attention to what I'm doing right now. Sometimes it's just it's nice to let your... The best way to get to know an area is to let your feet do the walking for you. That's like my feet have all my senses in a way. I can't assume that, of course, because I've fallen off a few logs in my time. <laughs> you know, the feet have a kind of vision, and the feet have a kind of ears, and the feet have a kind of smell, a kind of instinct. <laughs> so, they don't often get me into trouble. Boom, check, boom, boom. Find different ways of going places. <laughs> I mean, this is a pretty rough and tumble area as it is. It's not a set path. It's more like this intersecting subtle deer trails. So.
it's kind of a nice little area for me to not exactly know where I am. Path of least resistance. This is nice. It's nice to be at this point in the day. It's like a vacation for me and not be 10 miles away from home. This is, that's why I'm doing this. You know, I get a, I get the wild experience without having to be 10 miles away from home. He was a wild man. What was he now? He was a wild man in his way. Oh, oh. Oh, okay, it's getting what a sweet smelling day it is. He was a, you see that? That's a footprint. I'm actually following him. I think yesterday's remarkably inventive footsteps. He was a wild man until he broke his neck and no one heard him scream like a dream to those who just wanted to hear him scream. You should not make of songs about things so very wrong unless your name is Mr. Jimmy Bean. Jimmy Bean, making up songs that are really mean since 1996. 1996, motherfucker. Oh, that was the year I didn't have sex for the first time. Actually, 1996. Yeah, I think something sexually would happen there. If I'm not mistaken, it wasn't very nice. Oh, looks like I found my way again. As luck would have. Christmas forest, and we've got skis. That's just good for everybody. It just makes sense. It's like the number two. Completion. You know, one, two. I actually found a pair of shoes on the beach. Here we go. So I'm going to turn this off for a bit. And then uh, we can give us a little... Mm, that's a little reward for our day. <laughs> Sky opening up. I'll get back.